Welcome back to the Bitcoin layer. I'm Nick Batia. Today, we welcome back Andrew Polstra. He is head of research at Blockstream. And Andrew is an OG Bitcoin developer, someone that can bring a tremendous amount of insight on matters of Bitcoin cryptography. Andrew, thank you for joining us. Hey, Nick. Great to be here. Andrew, you want to talk today about how we can make Bitcoin more sustainable for the long term. And part of that, you believe, is through the use of covenants. So let's start there. What are Bitcoin covenants and what is your vision for Bitcoin here? Sure. <clears throat> um, See, so yeah, on, on a high level, right, I kind of feel like there are two big user issues with Bitcoin. One is custody, really. Um, and the other is the like payment, like payment processing, payment network kind of stuff. So usually when you think about Bitcoin, right, and you think about Bitcoin improvements, you're thinking about Lightning, you're thinking about the payment processing side of things. How can we make this more convenient? How can we make transactions go faster and, and maybe not have to worry about confirmations? How can you make fees more predictable? So on and so forth. The other side of that which I personally spend more time thinking about is custody, right? How do you store your coins? How do you um, protect them from theft? How do you protect them from either confiscation or censorship or loss, right? So covenants are kind of a low level improvement to the Bitcoin base layer that would actually improve both situations, both on the, the payment side and, and on the custody side. And what they are, is an extension to Bitcoin that would allow you, allow your wallet to control where your funds are going when you spend coins. So to give a bit of context for that, Bitcoin today has a scripting system and this script system allows you to check that before you spend coins, you have to sign the transaction with certain public keys. It lets you check a couple other conditions that are used by the Lightning Network to kind of link together payment channels into PALs and stuff. And unless you check, um, unless you check time locks, unless you combine these in various ways to do combinations of checks. But what all of these checks have in common is that once they are satisfied, once you have a signature, once you have a hash premium, once you have, you know, the coins are old enough, whatever, whatever you're checking, then the coins can go anywhere. So it's kind of a, a lock, basically, is the way that the script system works. So your wallet typically would construct an address that corresponds to a script that corresponds to a lock that just says, here's my public key. And in order for these coins to move, you need to produce a signature with that public key. Okay, so that's nice. But it would be good if you could say not only if the public key is present, then the coins can just move, then they're free, they can go wherever the user wants. In a lot of cases, you want to constrain that in some way. And the classic example is that of a vault. And this is a construction that's sort of been floating around the Bitcoin space for almost a decade now, uh, but isn't really possible in Bitcoin today. The way that a vault works is that rather than directly spending your coins, you first send them to a staging area where they sit for a day or for a week, or you know, there's parameters you can configure, however long you want to do this. And then after they sat there for a little while, you move the coins. Up. And using covenants, you can enforce on the blockchain that you have to do this. You can't just spend the coins freely. You have to first put them into the staging area. And why would you do this? Well, the reason you would do this is that if you're worried about your keys being stolen and some attacker using their keys, you don't want the attacker to be able to take your coins and run away with them, right? So if you have this kind of staging area that you're required to use, then so would an attacker be. So in the case that your keys get stolen, the attacker tries to take the coins. Well, they move it into the staging area and they're going to sit there for a few days and then the attacker can, pl can claim them. Well, within those couple of days, you can, well, you'll notice, of course, you'll see the coins have moved out of where they're supposed to be and now they're sitting in a staging area prepared to be stolen. And the vault has an additional feature, which is while it's in the staging area, you are allowed to reset the timer and reset the destination. So you can say, no, they're not going to the attacker, they're going back to me. 
Now, if the attacker has stolen your keys, the attacker might just do the same thing, right, and redirect. And so there are some variants of the vault construction that has kind of a second backup key that will override the first, so you could actually claw them back. But even absent a variants like that, and you can sort of imagine you could get arbitrarily complicated. And, um, but even absent, you know, backup keys and, uh, and the ability to directly override things, just keeping the coins in the staging area rather than in the attacker's control gives you a fair bit of control over what's happening, right? It means that the attacker won't be able to get the coins. As long as you're willing to pay the network fee every couple of days to reset the timer, the worst the attacker can do is just freeze your funds so they're not accessible to either of you. And for the attacker to do this, they have to remain online, which means that if you're trying to do some sort of forensic investigation, you're trying to figure out who this is or stop them or just hope they get bored or something, you have some opportunity to do that without the coins then you know filtering into the, the blockchain and disappearing, uh, never to be seen again, right? And this also helps to disincentivize theft, right? A attacker is probably, hopefully, not going to steal your keys if they know that the best they can do is, is get trapped in this staging area loop where they wind up spending network fees just to grief you and they're not even getting any coins out of it. So that vault construction is something that I think would make a lot of people, certainly me, more comfortable if we were able to store our, our long-term coins there, right? Because a lot of... The way that I store my long-term coins is that they're not actually online all the time, right? It's actually a little bit of a chore. I don't even have a watch-only wallet that's actively monitoring the blockchain, although I suppose that I could, but for privacy reasons, I just prefer that they're totally off offline. So I only actually check on them every few days or every few weeks even, um, depending on you know, whether I think about it, right? And it would be nice if I had this vault construction so that if something were to happen to my long-term storage keys, then I wouldn't need to react quickly because I'm not going to react quickly, right? So you can imagine if my coins are stolen today, I might not even notice for over a week. And then by that point, they're long gone, right? So if I had this vault construction, that would give me quite a bit more confidence. And then one other thing that I'll, I'll list before you know, handing, handing the mic back to you is the idea of rate limiting. So another kind of neat thing you could do with the same construction is that you could say there's a master key on these coins and that can just spend all the coins. But I could have a secondary key, and that key is only allowed to move, say, like, you know, 0.1 Bitcoin a day, or something like that. And so then I have this online key that I can use for my day-to-day -day transactions. It kind of is like an ATM withdrawal limit, right? Um, the point is to rate limit, if somebody's stolen your, your debit card or whatever, to rate limit how much money they can move. And in fact, if you don't like the ATM withdrawal fee, you can call your bank, and in most cases you can change it, right? But it's actually there for your benefit as kind of a security thing, and you probably would prefer that the ATM limit fee is there. And the, the vault, right, the covenants can allow you to do effectively the same thing with your Bitcoins, right? You have a master key, which would be equivalent to physically showing up in the bank with your password and improving your identity. But then you have secondary keys that can only be used to spend a certain amount of, of your coins, and the remainder is forced to go back into the covenant. And then it, it ha would have to sit there until the next day when your, your limit resets. So those are the kind of things custody-wise that covenants would improve. The Bitcoin layer is proud to be sponsored by River. Go check them out today at river.com slash TBL for a special offer of up to $100 worth of Bitcoin for free when you go sign up. Now, River is a Bitcoin-only exchange. That means there's no confusion when you go there. They allow you to deposit and withdraw via Lightning Network. They have a zero-fee recurring purchase order feature. And what we love the most about River is not only do they encourage you to get self-custody, but they're there to help educate you on self-custody and everything there is to know about Bitcoin. Go check them out today, river.com slash TBL. Now, let's move to another high level topic that's associated with this you're you want to talk about how bitcoin has not had a, a soft fork since taproot and before no. that segwit both highly contentious and scar tissue uh involved um is what i think you're implying that there's an overhang here and an unwillingness to do future soft work so what do what do uh, covenants rely on from a soft fork perspective from a high level, and then we can drill down. 
Sure, yeah. So as I mentioned, covenants, you can't do covenants on Bitcoin today. You can do kind of hacky emulation of them by doing pre-signed transactions, right? So in the case of the vault, like I could sign a transaction that just moves the coin and put a time lock on it, do stuff like that. But then I have this pile of pre-signed transactions laying around and I need to replay them onto the network in the correct order and, and worry if somebody else finds them and replays. Covenants will let you do it on chain where the blockchain is actually enforcing the rules that I'm describing for these rate limits or these vaults or whatever you want. So we would need essentially a new opcode. There, there are three or four covenant proposals that are floating around that you can find on the Bitcoin mailing list, see a lot of discussion. And on bitcoindelving.org, uh, which is kind of the newfangled version of the mailing list, which has kind of cleaner spam moderation stuff. I mean, it works through the website instead of email, so it's just works uh, better in a lot of ways. What we would need is an opcode, and I'll probably talk maybe about two specific examples. Op CTV is probably the most popular and the most well-known. Um, probably a lot of your viewers have, have even heard that acronym, even though it's a bit of a technical, obscure thing. Um, and then OpCat, which is even more obscure, but as I'll argue is, is simpler in some ways. So to add a new opcode to Bitcoin, we would need to fork it in. We do what's called a soft fork. And what a soft fork is, is you change the rules of the network in such a way that the new rules are stricter than the old rules, like precisely stricter. Meaning that under the new rules, validators will only accept things that would have been accepted under the old rules. There may be new things they won't accept, right? Um, so you're kind of kind of narrowing the space of valid transactions. And the benefit of making sure that you're doing the strict narrowing is that people don't need to update on time in a timely manner, right? So if you if we were to soft fork in a new opcode and you were running an old node and you didn't know about this opcode, you wouldn't enforce the rules implied by those opcodes, but any transactions that were valid, you would still consider valid. And any transactions that were newly invalid, well, you might accept them, but hopefully if the rest of the network's updated, you're not going to see them, right? The network just won't let them reach you. They're not going to get into blocks, so. so uh, so you don't have to worry. You don't, and then finally, when you do update your node, then you'll start enforcing the new rules and, and get the additional security. And if you care about this new opcode and want to use it, you should certainly do this. If you don't care about it, you can kind of shrug and you know let the network let the network enforce the new opcode for you for a little while. So the last two soft forks to Bitcoin were both pretty big, right? So going back way back to 2015, 2016 or so, we had SegWit. And SegWit was kind of much more controversial and there were a lot more fireworks than I think anybody involved expected. Um, amusingly, even the name SegWit is short for segregated witness, which is the idea that you have your transaction data, that's part of the transaction data, that's this witness data, which is a computer science term for data that's just used to attest that the transaction is valid. But it doesn't, it's not really part of, it, it doesn't define what the transaction is. Right, your transaction says you're taking these certain inputs, you're creating certain outputs, you have a version, you have a lock time associated, et cetera, et cetera. The witness data is the signatures, it's the hash preimages, you know, whatever you need to make that transaction legit, you tack that onto the transaction. The idea behind segregated witness was that we would segregate the witness. So you, you now have the transaction in two parts, they're committed in, in the blockchain separately or into the block separately, and this can make certain validation modes more efficient. And this name was deliberately very technical and long and hard to say because it was kind of a, a technical improvement, right? We didn't want there to be memes. We didn't want like, you know, people to go crazy. And then because we're not very good at names, um, and I won't, I won't point the person who, uh, who came up with this name, but we're not very good at, at our goals, right? The people immediately shortened it to Segwit, which is really fun to say. And like, they had a cool logo. Somebody made a logo for it and everything. And like, crap, okay. So now, now this is a big public thing, which, you know, is it, fine. People, people should participate and there should be stakeholders and stuff. But then there was an incredible controversy around it. There were, were some things that were somewhat legit, right? People were concerned. So Segwit, by separating the witness data, we had an opportunity to kind of make the witness part of the transaction, in some sense, arbitrarily large, um, or, or allow allow the limit to be arbitrarily large. And we, we landed on a limit that would allow blocks to be roughly four megs in total, 
uh, but on average probably two, two and a half megs versus the original one meg limit. And that's something that's, that's quite tangible, right? Like the, the higher you set this limit, you know, the, the more computing resources you need potentially, although SegWit made things more efficient, so it's not quite so straightforward. Um, and so you might be concerned about making it too high, but the smaller it is, right, the, the less transaction throughput you have, at least in the base layer. And so there was a lot of discussion about that that maybe wasn't necessarily technically well informed, but, but is certainly understandable and something that people would reasonably have opinions on. There was also a ton of, like, bluntly conspiracy theory kind of stuff happening in SegWit. There are people saying that we were like breaking the chain of signatures was a slogan that was thrown around and that we were removing the signatures from transactions, which is, is untrue, right? It's just like factually untrue. Before you had a transaction, it was all committed to the block in one blob. Now you have two parts to the transaction and they're committed to the, the block in two blobs. But this exact same data still exists. The exact same data still committed is just like a small technical change in the hashing structure. And this kind of thing we were not expecting. I didn't really know what to do with this. Certainly in the technical community, like we didn't know where this was coming from. We knew like a couple of the actors kind of pushing these things, but we didn't understand their motivations. And then later, uh, much later after SegWit had deployed, we, we discovered that there was actually like quite a bit of money at stake. There was this optimization, this, this proprietary optimization to the mining process called ASIC boost that SegWit undermined. So by virtue of this very technical rearranging of the hash structure, we tweaked the way that the block hash was computed in a way that undermined some code inside of ASICs that a certain manufacturer was building, which is something we had no idea what happened. They didn't tell us, and they didn't because it was a trade secret and there were maybe patent concerns and there would have been, like, it would have been like a big controversial deal if it had been public. So they didn't say anything about this. Um, they just really did not like SegWit. And there was just this passionate, like, we hate SegWit and there's this huge PR push and, and stuff that nobody on the technical side or the, the Bitcoin development side was really prepared for or expecting even, right? And amusingly, and there was also, there was also this meme that the SegWit was increasing the complexity of, of Bitcoin. That it was adding stuff to Bitcoin. It was unnecessarily increasing the complexity and like, why if we just want to increase the block size, let's just change the constant, you know? Um, why are we doing all this crazy technical stuff? Amusingly to me, um, SegWit, the complexity of SegWit was all in the peer-to-peer -peer update process. Like how can we introduce this new transaction format while making sure that old nodes who haven't upgraded are not going to be confused by it. They're not going to ban peers. They don't get a fork of the network, not because of the blockchain validation rules, just, but just because the, the different nodes won't talk to each other. How do we prevent that from happening? And this got no play. This was, I think, so technical and, and to the side and beside the point that nobody was yelling and screaming about this. So in that specific area where the technical people were like genuinely pretty scared and like doing incredible QA and, and over-engineering and testing and so forth, we were actually just allowed to develop in peace and we didn't have people butting in and um, trying to, uh, to opine about things that, uh, that they didn't have the context for and stuff. Uh, the price of people complained saying what being complicated were actually not that complicated at all, honestly. So, this really scarred a lot of people. Like, people who were just trying to do technical things, who like, were trying to improve Bitcoin and were like, really proud of themselves for coming up with this scheme where we were able to fix like five problems at once, right? We were able to do a modest blockchain size increase. We were able to do so while improving the efficiency of transaction validation in a couple ways to make this size increase actually result in less CPU cost for validating large transactions. It was a, you can look at the quadratic hashing bug if you're, you're curious about what that looks like. We were able to improve the signature hash algorithm, which is the data that your wallet commits to, to allow wallets to care less about the, the precursor transactions than they did before. Basically, the wallet could assume certain things about the past transactions and if their assumptions were wrong, their signature would be invalid, so it didn't matter. Invalid signatures are, are always harmless for a wallet. Uh, what wallets are scared about is they make a valid signature for something they weren't expecting, right? That's dangerous, right? Then your coins are. So a lot of wa wallet software development um, goes into making sure that you are signing exactly the correct data. And in some cases, this involves going not only to the current transaction, but the past transaction. SIG would improve that. Taproot actually improved it even further. We, we didn't quite finish the job there. Um, 
what is a problem to be solved? Oh, transaction malleability, of course. With this huge, they're going way back, right, to 2014. Um, uh, back maybe even further. Um, people may re maybe remember like Mt. Gox exploding, right? And they blame this transaction malleability uh, bug, which was that by changing the signatures in a transaction, you could change the TXID, which is how the transactions validated on the blockchain. And this confused a lot of wallet software. They would, they would create a transaction, the TXID would change on the network, and then they wouldn't realize the transaction was confirmed, and they might create a different transaction. And that is 100% avoidable, to be, be clear, but you have to be a little bit careful as a wallet developer. And, and Mt. Gox, among others, was not very careful, and Mt. Gox would create multiple independent transactions processing the same transaction, which uh, a wallet should never do. Right. Like if you're going to make multiple transactions that are supposed to represent the same thing, just make sure they are incompatible so only one can be confirmed. Um, but where transaction malleability was a real problem was in things like the Lightning Network, where you want to have multiple transactions being chained that aren't necessarily confirmed quickly. And in that case, if your transaction IDs might change out from under you, then that could invalidate this chain of unconfirmed transactions, even if all participants in the chain are, are signing things and, and you know there's no security risk inherent in the chain of the transactions not being confirmed um, because you, you don't need the confirmation that all parties agree on the transaction state under, under certain technical uh, circumstances. We were able to fix that. We were able to eliminate the malleability bug so now people can sign and re-sign transactions and it's not going to break, break chains of transactions. Um, so I guess ironically, for all the memeing about like SegWit breaking the chain of signatures, pre-SegWit you couldn't create chains of transactions, and post-SegWit you could, so we're actually creating new chains of, of transactions. So we were able to solve all of these things in one like very elegant thing that improved efficiency and, and was conceptually simple, that the upgrade process was not simple, but conceptually SegWit was very simple. And then it just like turned into this like huge cluster for, for no good reason, um, really. So. Fast forward a few years, right? We're deploying Taproot. Taproot is significantly simpler. The upgrade mechanism for Taproot is significantly simpler than SegWit. Unlike SegWit, we are not introducing a new transaction format, and we're not affecting the way that block headers are constructed or, or blocks are constructed or anything like that. We're not affecting the peer-to-peer -peer layer. What we're doing with Taproot is we are taking an, an Upgrade mechanism that SegWit introduced, where you're allowed to basically create a new kind of address. Or not a new, we're, we're still using the best 32, like BC1 kind of thing. But rather than starting BC1Q, we're going to start BC1P. And the next one is, I won't, I'm not prepared, I won't, I won't try to look it up. But future, future SegWit versions, right, would have the same, like there's just one letter that is really not important to a user, you just increment that um, in a certain random order that was chosen to try to minimize um, try to minimize hand transcription errors. So we use that mechanism. And what that is, or what that means to old validators, is that they will see a transaction. They will see that an output is now SegWit version 1 instead of SegWit version 0. And a node that knows Taproot will say, oh, version 1, that's Taproot. I need to apply the Taproot validation rules. An old node that doesn't know about Taproot will say, oh, that's version 1. I don't know what version 1 is. I'm going to assume, because I'm seeing it, that the network has activated it in some form, and I'm just going to let that pass, and you know, hopefully, hopefully the network is going to uh, validate that for me. And I, but I may even inform the user, say, hey, there are these V1 transactions appearing on the network, there's probably an update, you should update your software, so we're validating these V1s. It's very self-contained, it's identifiable as an update, and it all fits into the existing transaction structure. Right? There's no, uh, there's no need for old nodes to there's no need for us to like try to shape the peer-to-peer -peer network to try to pretend to old nodes that, that the status quo is still going. It's, it's self-contained, it's, it's riskless, and um, the yeah, there's just no risk of a network fork being caused by this. We, we have a, a deliberate software mechanism, mechanism which um, is not going to cause forks and is still detectable as an update. That's what I'm trying to say. So you can inform your users or you can you know, react to whatever you want to do. And say what version 2, if such a thing will exist, or version 3 will we'll use exactly the same mechanism. So it's, it's much simpler in that sense, right? We're only changing a certain output type. Taproot, what it does, 
is also in many ways simpler than what SegWit did because we're not introducing this new witness field that needs to be validated in a certain way and have a new encoding format, et cetera, et cetera. We're using the existing witness fields. What we're doing is saying, well, now your output, rather than committing to a script, so in, in the pre-SegWit days and even to SegWit, we had this paradigm that I mentioned at the beginning where you have a script that lists the conditions under which the coins are spent. In Taproot, we said, well, usually, and the vast majority of, of the time, you have a script, but all the script's doing is checking a signature with a single key. And kind of secondary to Taproot, we did a bunch of research to do also the cool thing with single keys, where you can actually have multiple participants and you can do fairly complicated constructions still using a single key. But, but we can think of a single key as being a single user wallet, right? Even without doing any, any cool technical things, the vast majority of Bitcoin outputs are single keys for single wallets. And so why don't we make that primary? We'll put a single key there, and we have a clever mechanism by which we can commit to a backup script inside of that key, but it will still look like a key. And that way you can do things like having a primary key that normally you would spend the coins with, but having a backup script that maybe is gated by a time lock or something that would allow you to move the coins with a secondary key or allow you to move the coins if a certain hash preimage is revealed or, or you know, if, if a payment channel is updated or whatever you might want to do. But you don't reveal that unless you actually need to use it. So we've covered the majority of cases where there's just one key and then the majority of the cases where there's more than a key where you have a key plus a backup is really what you're doing. Even in Lightning, the way that it works, you have payment channels, which are two-party payment channels, and in what we call the optimistic case, the two parties in the payment channel just both sign the transaction and there's no additional data that needs to go on the blockchain beyond that. And it's only if one party drops out or is griefing or something that you use the full complexity of the Lightning Protocol and you say, oh, here's this backup case that allows the coins to still go through even if one party is, is trying to prevent it. So in Taproot, in principle, you could do something you could have payment channels that just look like single keys for single wallets. So this is cool, it's a big privacy benefit. It's a big efficiency benefit, both in terms of space, you're only encoding a single key, as well as in validation time, because now people are only validating a single key. They don't need to run through this complicated script. They might have branches and ifs and stuff. Um, and a future lightning development, there's, there's a new technique called PTLCs that, that kind of use Taproot even harder, that, that put more stuff into the key. So they not only have, if the two people sign, the coins move, otherwise you go back to the script. With PTLCs, you're even able to pile more of the script into the key itself through an interactive protocol that never touches the blockchain at all. And there's some, some further privacy benefits and stuff. It's all, it's all very cool. But what touches the blockchain is very simple, right? You now have a new output type, which is a key. You see that key, you check, uh, you, when you see a transaction spending a taproot output, you check a signature with that key. Or you actually look how many pieces of the data are on the chain. If there's one, it's a signature. If there's two, then it's a proof that a script was committed to the key, and then there's witness data for that script. But it's very straightforward, right? You just count the data, and then you can tell what to do. And one more thing I'll say about Taproot is that it lets you commit not only to a script, but actually to many scripts using something called a Merkle tree. And you can have like millions. Um, there's in principle, pretty much no limit to how many scripts you can put into. Certainly, you could put, if, if you wanted to have literally billions of scripts, you could do that with Taproot. And you have a billion possible scripts, a billion possible ways to spend the coins. Uh, don't ask me why you would do this, but you could. And you just reveal the one that you use. So all of the other billions of scripts are never revealed. So even in the case that you're using the script backup, there's a privacy and efficiency benefit. So this is, this is kind of useful. So, with Taproot, we no longer have the update complexity of changing the peer-to-peer -peer layer. We no longer had the you know, somewhat legitimate political controversy around changing the block size or some other user-visible parameter. We were no longer changing block headers or anything, so miners basically had no reason to care about Taproot, other than perhaps they, they cared about it for, for technical reasons, but it certainly wouldn't affect the mining process at all. And yet, we were so scared after, after SegWit, or like something's going to blindside us, like somehow someone's going to show up and like just kill this thing, you know. 
And so there was a tremendous amount of basically infighting where people were trying to mitigate potential controversy in some way, but there wasn't actually any controversy that I was really aware of. There was a little bit of like half-hearted, some people complaining about post-quantum, like taproot affecting the quantum security of Bitcoin. Well, I mean, Bitcoin is not quantum secure right now, right? Taproot, it's hard to say that taproot makes it worse because the, the situation with quantum computers and Bitcoin is really bad, right? It's almost, it's almost impossible to make the situation worse, which we should address, you know, sometime in the next decade or two, but well, that's another topic. Um, there was really no opposition to Tapper. And in the end, what happened was um, HL101, that's their, uh, their, their screen name, uh, it's a Bitcoin core developer, proposed this thing called Speedy Trial. And Speedy Trial was basically, how about we just try to deploy it? over the course of 30 days or 60 days or something. And if anybody tries to stop it, it will just stop and then we can regroup. Okay, but let's just try to do it. And like have a million and one ways, like miners can just like nix it, you know, there's a signaling mechanism and stuff. It's very easy to knock this down, okay? So let's just do it and see if anyone knocks it down. So we did it and nobody knocked it down, of course, and it deployed, so ta-da. So going forward to covenants, covenants are even simpler. We're going progressively simpler, right? In Segwit, we are changing like all sorts of stuff in the, in the transaction format. In Taproot, we just added a single, um, a single new output version using the Segwit version. There's one more layer of, of simplicity we could do, which is that in Taproot, I mentioned you can have many different scripts. So there's actually a version on the scripts themselves, which allow you to mix and match multiple versions of scripts within Taproot, which is kind of cool. So we could do that. But with Covenants, we could probably even go one simpler and just introduce a new opcode into the existing script version. And the way that that's done, so that, let's recall that the, the way the soft forks work, right, is that old nodes, when they see the new code, just accept it, right? They say, okay, the network's going to deal with it. Like, maybe flag the user, but the network's going to deal with it, so we're just accept it for now. In Taproot, we introduce the whole pile of opcodes to our scripting system that currently just immediately pass the transaction. So whenever a node sees one of these, they're like, oh, the transaction's good. Doesn't matter what happened up to this point in the script, the transaction's good. And the idea there is that these op success opcodes, that's what we call them, op success. The idea there is that they would be used to introduce new opcodes. So one day we would take one of these op success opcodes, we would rename it op CTV or op cat or L enhance or you know, whatever we want to call it. And then old nodes would still see them as a success, and say, okay, all good. And new nodes would enforce the new rules. So that's the upgrade mechanism that we would do. So we're really zeroing in on a very small part of the transaction. We're adding new validation logic that would be very self-contained inside of the script interpreter. Uh, the script interpreter is, is the biggest part of, arguably the biggest part of Bitcoin's consensus rules and the most complicated and scary, but adding isolated pieces to it is actually something that we can do quite safely with a lot of confidence. And so that's the kind of soft fork that we would need to introduce covenants. And so my current favorite proposal that would be a covenant proposal, but also does a whole bunch else is something called opcat. And opcat is a new opcode, a new version of a very old opcode, which on a technical level, what it does is it takes two pieces of the data within the script inter interpreter and just puts them together. That's all it does. And it's this very simple, right? You can write this in like five lines of code. If you don't do some validation, you can do it in one line of code, but we need to. So the original, so opcat was actually present in Bitcoin way back in 2009 through half of 2010. So I guess less than two years of Bitcoin's life, uh, we had opcat. And there was a problem with Satoshi's implementation, which was that it didn't validate how large the, the data would be after you concatenated it. So there's another opcode, uh, dup, which is short for duplicate. And you could do this thing where you do dup cat, dup cat, dup cat over and over. It's kind of fun to say. But what you're doing is every time you do dup cat, you're taking some data, duplicating it, squishing it together. All right? And so now it's twice as big. And then you duplicate it, squish it together. And then I, I can't do it again with my hands, but you can see it's going to get twice as big every time. And, um, you know, like the, the parable of the, the king with the checkerboard and the rice, it says, like, put one one grain of rice on the first square of the checkerboard and two on the next and four on the next and so on. And by the end, you have two to the 64 grains of rice. 
Well, 2 to the 64 is roughly a 1 with 21 zeros after that, give or take a couple of zeros. That's just a, a, massive, a massive quantity, right? And there was no limit. You could go past 2 to the 64 to 2 to the you know, 200 if you wanted. And then you would have something on the stack which would acquire more memory than there are atoms in the universe. And of course, it would just crash notes long before you got to the point. So to fix that, you just add a single check, two more lines of code. If, this, if the concatenated size is too big, then fail. Okay, two lines of code. That's all we need to add to make cat safe. And then the rest is just concatenate the two things. So you can look, if, if you're curious, you can find the reference code uh, for a, a bit proposal for opcat, which has, I think it's five lines, basically. So if there are two items on the stack, then, or if there aren't two items on the stack, then fail. If the two items together are too big, then fail. Otherwise, stick them together and put it back on the stack. Dead simple. And what's fascinating about this is that it enables a weak form of covenants. So remember that I, I described covenants as controlling where the coins are going. And the way that you do this it, within the script is that you look at the data of the transaction within the script, and then you do some computation on that. So you might say, like, well, how many outputs are there? There have to be only two outputs. Okay, and one of them is only allowed to be a certain size and the other has to be changed and it has to go back into the covenant, something like that. There's a basic covenant that does a rate limit, right? You look at the transaction, you say, is this transaction shaped according to the rules of the covenant? If so, it's good. If not, you know, it fails. The transaction is invalid. So cat, as I doesn't actually access the transaction at all, right? It doesn't... Um, it, is it just looks at the top two stack elements and, and then tries to put them together. So, And there's no existing way to get the elements, any part of your transaction onto the stack, right? So there's, it's really kind of surprising that cat would let you do anything. But it turns out that cat is just extraordinarily powerful. So with the Schnorr signatures that Taproot introduced, combined with opcat, you can enforce a certain kind of signature shaped object, which is actually a hash of all of the data in the transaction that gets signed. And I have a, a couple of blog posts um, that I'll, I'll, I'll maybe give to you, Nick, and we can put it in the, in the episode description that describes technically what you're doing. But on a high level, the way it works is that we want to, to check the transaction data, right? We want to somehow constrain the transaction data. There's only one opcode. Well, a couple opcodes in Bitcoin that check transaction data, which are the check sig opcodes. And the taproot check sig add, and before taproot check multisig, which are just check sig but for multiple keys. Right? And the way that it works, right, is it takes all the transactions. From the stack, it takes a signature and a public key. And then internally, it hashes up the transaction and then verifies the signature on the hash of the transaction and, and gives you a pass fail. Right? So. And it does that all internally, and it just gives you, it takes a pub key and signature, it outputs a bit, right? Did it pass or did it fail? Um, sometimes it doesn't even do that, it just fails the transaction. Well, it turns out with cat, you can, and, and knowing algebraically the structure of an elliptic curve signature, the digital signature that's put on the chain, you can constrain the signature in such a way that you can force it to include, directly include, a hash of all the data that gets signed using cat. So we're taking all the internal computations going on in check sig and we're reaching and we're like threading it backwards through the mathematics to get the signature on the stack to have to equal the hash of the transaction. And once you have a hash of the transaction, then you've got the transaction data, right? Because then you say, you, you tell the user, well, you have to provide all the actual transaction data as a witness. In your script, you hash it up, make sure it matches your target hash and now you've got the real data sitting there, and then you can constrain it. So the form of covenant you can do just with cat and with the, um, and, and knowing the algebra of signatures. So there's kind of a fun high level meta lesson here, which is that covenants are very close to being in Bitcoin. Like there's a very, there's almost no functionality you can add to Bitcoin without enabling some form of covenants because I don't know why, really. It's kind of a weird mathematical, like it feels like there's some mathematical theorem that is just very difficult to avoid this. And it's not something like 
Turing completeness, where we know how to get Turing complete. You just have unbounded loops, basically, is, is equivalent to Turing completeness. It just seems like there's this ability to, to do covenants that your script interpreter needs to have a very narrow set of functionality. And even a very constrained set of functionality, if it's not narrow enough in some sense that I, I don't really have a good, good intuition for, if it's not narrow enough, then you can do covenants just by somehow getting the transaction data check statement and just threading it backwards. So cat gives you one way to do covenants. And what's exciting about this is two things. One is that cat is incredibly simple, right? In my hierarchy of simplicity of soft forks, I guess pretty much the simplest possible thing you could do is adding a single opcode and that opcode does nothing but manipulate stack elements and it manipulates them in a dead simple way, right? Cat is also very generally useful. So one fear with a lot of covenant proposals is that there's kind of a trade-off between the safety of what you're doing with covenants, like, like how expressive your covenant, um, how expressive the covenants you're enabling versus some of the fears that people have about covenants and, and versus the fears that people have about the complexity and stuff. So a lot of the difficulty with covenant proposals is that people are worried about getting that trade-off wrong. And they're worried that they might have a covenant proposal that can do like 90% of everything we want to do with covenants. And then we'll never get that 10% because the marginal cost of, of adding things to Bitcoin in the future to get that extra 10% just won't be there, right? So it's like, it's gotta be 100% or it's gotta be nothing. Well, with CAT, we do get that 90%. Okay, so it's not complete. But CAT is not, it barely changes the marginal cost of other covenant proposals, right? So the way it gets you this 90% is like really ad hoc and ugly and inefficient, right? You would not want to use CAT just for the sake of getting covenants. But cat also lets you do a whole pile of other things, right? It lets you verify Merkle trees. It lets you do, um, that's, the, that's a big one that's, that's very generally useful. Um, it lets you constrain your signatures in other ways. It lets you do arbitrary precision arithmetic. So right now in Bitcoin, if you want to add or subtract numbers, you can only do it with 32 bit numbers. And you can't really multiply except by repeated addition. And you quickly run into issues with the, the, the bit width of your numbers. It's quite difficult to do. Cat lets you break apart larger numbers into smaller ones that you can then use the regular arithmetic opcodes for, for example. So there's just so much expressivity that you get from, from having cat that, uh, that you don't otherwise. So it's a super general Swiss army knife kind of thing that can do you know a million different things. It doesn't do any of them necessarily very well or efficiently, but it's a dead simple upgrade. And, and, but because it doesn't do them very well, it's not going to step on the toes of other covenant proposals, right? We could deploy CAT and nobody's going to say, you know, let's not do CTV because CAT already does what CTV does. Or let's not do um, SIGAS any prep out because that's already what OpCAT does. Or let's not add better arithmetic opcodes because you can already do it with CAT. You know, like all of those things in some sense are true but cat does it so badly that it um, it basically it makes it possible, right? So we can see if people really want to do these things using cat, they can do them, and that's and it does a few things well as well. Like it's not all just like a million bad things. It, it does a couple things well, notably verifying Merkle trees. But um, it's a very simple, safe soft fork that would lead us into a world where people can actually do these new things with Bitcoin maybe not as efficiently as they might like, but then we can start getting feedback from users. Then we can say, well, what are people actually doing? What do they want to do so badly that they're willing to do it with cat? What are they doing with covenants? What if, like, what ideas do we have about vaults or rate limits? Or um, there, there's a proposal from Jeremy Rubin as part of CTV where you use covenants to um, send a payment to, you know, thousands or thousands of people, like from an exchange, and then those individual people decide the network fee and decide how to, how to, when and how to actually withdraw the funds. So it's cheaper for the exchange and more control for the user. There's all these kind of things that maybe sound good on paper, but don't work in real life or the opposite things that like we think are gross and ugly on paper, but then it turns out that people really want to do them. Well, if we have cat there to bring us from, from impossible to possible, 
then we can start seeing that and getting feedback and informing our future covenant proposals and stuff like that. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of harping on this because I, I did a podcast recently um, where I was talking about this and a lot of CTV proponents were, were kind of upset at me um, for like saying cat's the best and stuff when cat's like not the best at, at any particular thing it does. Um, I don't like cat because it's better. I don't like cat as an alternative to other covenant proposals. I like cat as a precursor as a, just a dramatic improvement in Bitcoin's expressivity for incredibly low risk. And so this brings us back to the fears that people have around soft forks. And as I've kind of been hinting at, the technical worries, the worries that will mess it up and it will actually be a soft or a hard fork or it will actually crash nodes or it will actually do something horrible. Those we've basically eliminated with cat. With cat we've zeroed into something so small and so simple that there's really no technical concerns. And the upgrade mechanism is something that we've used in the past, just replacing opcodes with a uh, opcodes that used to do nothing with an opcode that now does something. We've done that in the past um, to introduce relative lock times into Bitcoin, for example. And Taproot lets us do this in, in even a more stable way, um, where, uh, where we don't have to be as careful in order to do it properly. Like it's really kind of, we've, we've idiot proofed certain kinds of soft works from a technical perspective. Um, with all of these covenant proposals, there's a bit of a political argument about covenants. And these come in, in maybe two forms. One is a broad, like, um, a friend of mine calls it the, the ossificationist, right? People who think if Bitcoin shouldn't change, it. Bitcoin is done. Um, and we shouldn't change it. We're just risking things. We might change the properties of the network. And then our sound money is really not so sound after all, if anybody can just change it kind of thing. And I would push against that and say, like, I really think we want covenants. We really want vaults. We really want rate limiting. Like, we really want the like extra control on, on how users, uh, uh, how recipients of funds control fees and stuff like that. Um, I really, I'm really sympathetic to the ossificationists, but like, I would really strongly say not yet. Like, let's let's figure covenants out first, um, at the very least. Um, and then there's a narrow, more narrow opposition where people specifically don't like covenants because they are concerned that covenants could be used to create colored coins, which are, are like uh, ERC tokens, they're like other tokens on the Bitcoin network, or they could be used to create some form of like permanent um, taint on Bitcoins where you have some sort of um, like three-letter agency marker on Bitcoins, and you have a covenant that enforces that that marker is preserved, that the coins are moving through the network, and now you have a censorship risk or a fungibility risk or something like that. And I'm sympathetic to that fear abstractly, right? Those are all terrible things. But technically speaking, after many years of kind of thinking about how we can do this using covenants, there's really not any practical way to do these kind of things, in my view, and, and in the view of, of many other people. And, and we've we've had some public calls to like, can somebody demonstrate how to do this? And basically, if somebody wanted to do this, like you can imagine like the US Treasury like wanting to put some sort of like serial number onto Bitcoins or something. Well, for one thing, it's actually kind of hard from a technical perspective to imagine what that means, but let's imagine that's sensible and that they want to do it. Well, in order to do so, everybody would have to update their wallets in order to recognize these new treasury tainted things and be able to still spend and receive the coins. And why would any wallet update that? Because the users don't want that and wallet developers are not necessarily beholden to US law, certainly not all of them. Um, and many Bitcoin users are not subject to, like people just ignore it, right? It's unenforceable and it's, it's, it's not practical. It's technically extremely difficult in addition to being unenforceable. It would increase the cost on the network um, and the cost to users because there's extra data that has fees associated to it. So more than a privacy um, or, or like a civil liberties reason to oppose this, there's a direct economic reason to oppose this. So the, you know, the lobbyists would come out in full force and the lawyers and, and the big players would say like, no, we're absolutely not doing this. And, and then also just like the treasury wouldn't do that. The treasury understands that fungibility is necessary for sound money. At least some people, the, the wonks of the treasury, like understand these kind of things. So the monetary theorists of the treasury understand these kind of things. So they wouldn't do it. But I appreciate not everybody trusts the treasury. There's a good reason not to trust the treasury, right? But 
even if they were untrustworthy and they tried to do this terrible thing, they would run into social opposition, they'd run into technical opposition, they'd run into economic opposition. And these are pretty universal across all of these like horrible things that people do with covenants. And as an aside, if you're willing to accept social and economic and technical problems, you can actually kind of do this today using multi-signatures, where the treasury could show up at, at Coinbase's office and say you're only allowed to withdraw coins now to a two of two multi-signature between the user and the treasury. And the treasury would then say, well, we'll, we'll sign anything as long as it you know, includes our identifier or whatever we're doing. And then we just have to interact with every single Bitcoin user who's ever touched Coinbase and we'll make sure that the signature stays on it forever. And so that has the additional technical difficulty that the treasury would then be co-signing every single Bitcoin transaction. But you can see that, I mean, that's only a small additional problem on top of the other massive problems that anybody can see when you think about it. The treasury trying to do such a thing, right? It wouldn't get out the door, right? It wouldn't get to the door of the treasury, right? Nobody would, would be willing to admit that they were coming up with such a ridiculous idea. So, so I think that these covenant fears are, are kind of overblown. I think that they come from the early days of covenants before we were looking at specific concrete proposals and before we were trying to think like specifically, how would this work? And then it seemed a lot more plausible that like we were adding this expressivity that could be used for bad purposes and so maybe people will do it and maybe it's bad for the network kind of thing. And so I think that the anti-covenant sentiment is kind of shrinking. That, that view is, is kind of, of um, being uh, overwhelmed by the view that the extra expressivity that we get from covenants is worthwhile, right? So we, we both are coming to realize there's a lot more benefits to covenants than before, and also that the risks are probably overstated. So where I see the Bitcoin space moving is, let me try to tie all of the different threads together. Um, and I know I've been talking for like 25 straight minutes here, but, but I think I can tie it together. Um, we're moving away from the last software, which was really Taproot, which was really a nothing burger. Like all of our fears were like, I, I think completely misplaced on Taproot. And I, I think that's evidenced by how easy it was to deploy in the end. Um, the time has passed since then. So everyone who was stressed out over Taproot, you know, has had time to, to relax and, and maybe we're willing to do another fork. Um, people who are opposed to change in general and want Bitcoin to ossify and stuff, it also helps that there's been so much time, right? Like we're not, um, nobody's proposing that we start like changing Bitcoin every month and like start doing wild experimental things or anything like that. Like having, having a fork every couple of years where the number of years is, is even increasing, I, I you know, should give people some peace of mind who, who would otherwise worry about that. Um, people are warming up to the idea of covenants um, to its benefits and they're, they're cooling towards uh, the um, fears around it, right? Are starting to seem like, you know, when you turn the lights on, they've actually just, it was just shadows, right? Um, and the final point that I'll tie together is that we have this proposal up capped. So with covenants, it's actually like, this is the way that you want all of the fighting about covenants right now is the, the kind of fighting that you want to see in Bitcoin, where there are multiple technical proposals that have different trade-offs and different merits, and people are going back and forth and finding different variants and discovering new ways to do things that are, that are maybe um, more efficient or, or more expressive, or hopefully both, but usually you have to pick one, uh, than, other, than other proposals. We're learning and, and we're, you know, there's a lot more uh, light than heat being produced in this, this discussion. But what personally excites me is that we've got this specific opcode, opcat. Now that's a, a couple of, there's one more soft fork related by, uh, I think Chris Stewart, to add uh, better arithmetic opcodes. But cat, let's just focus on cat. It's very expressive, very narrowly focused. It doesn't step on the toes of the other proposals, right? So we're not forced to pick cat or other things. We pretty much want cat and other things. In fact, even if we had another covenant proposal, tomorrow, I would still be advocating for cat on top of the other covenant proposal because it lets you do these other things. Um, it lets you extend the arithmetic opcodes and compute Merkle trees and, and do all sorts of fun stuff and uh, and signature tricks and hash tricks. There's a lot. There's a lot of tricks that cat enables. So we are moving towards a world where 
And I should also thank Ethan and, and Arjun, the uh, the authors of the cat bit, by the way. So I, I've been kind of behind the scenes pushing for cat to like friends of mine who already agreed with me for many years, right? There's been like this this pro cat faction, which is all like people saying like, yeah, wouldn't it be great? But nobody did the work. Nobody wrote the five lines of code. Nobody wrote the BIP. Nobody made test vectors and stuff. And Ethan and Arden like came through and did it. And so now there's a mailing list post. There's discussion about it. There's a BIP proposal. It doesn't have a number yet, um, but hopefully it will uh, the next time Luke does his round. So the, the BIP maintainer is Luke Dash du uh, Dasher, is how it's pronounced. Um, and he, I think every month he has a certain day where he like goes through, and you'll see like 50 GitHub notifications from Luke all in one day. So I hope that we'll get a number on the next one of those. Um, because it, it seems like the, the discussion is quieting down. We, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we will see cat on Bitcoin soon, soon in Bitcoin time, right? You know, which means probably not for a year, um, maybe not for two, but you know, not for five years. You know, it's not like we're going to wait like five or, or 10 years or, or indefinite kind of thing. Um, it seemed like we're very close, right? We know what it will look like. I guess we still have to define activation parameters um, and there will be some discussion around that. But I think that the lessons from Taproot are that if you have a non-controversial, narrowly focused fork proposal, and you're able to get buy-in from the broader community, which is still not a super clear thing what that means, but certainly you can find like a lot of public actors who are talking about it and are aware of it um, and not opposed to it, then you can do the speedy trial thing and just kind of kind of deploy it. And the nice thing about CAT is that it's really, aside from enabling covenants, which which makes people nervous, is really not. It's 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 a technical thing, right? It's not a, it's not changing the meaning of Bitcoin. It's not changing the nature of Bitcoin in any way. It just adds some specific technical capabilities to the script. So, uh, so all these reasons give me optimism that uh, that we will do forks again. We have this nice like test case in, in the form of CAT um, that we can do where we don't need to have years of covenant discussions. Um, but unfortunately, and here the CTV people are going to be mad at me, I think we have years just of discussions before we could deploy something like CTV. Um, there are a couple of variants of CTV that are floating out there. There's something called OptX hash, which to a first approximation of CTV kind of split into two opcodes so that you can do some other intermediate computations. Um, there are proposals like there's, there's, uh, well, I, I, I don't want to like enumerate all of the proposals here because a lot of them I'm not technically familiar with, and I don't think it would be useful for me to just name a bunch of things. Uh, but you can find uh, discussion on the Bitcoin Dev mailing list and on Delving Bitcoin about all of this stuff. And there are no clear winners in my view, right? Like, there's a lot. We're still learning a lot, and there are still trade-offs that it's not obvious how we want to make. So, um, cat avoids it. That's 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 the yeah, end okay. Of the story. So what what I'm gonna do here is summarize what what I'm hearing, and then maybe you can just finish with the response or to emphasize any of these points. So for the viewer and the audience here, I believe what Andrew is trying to communicate to us is that Bitcoin covenants can be very powerful for the long term uh, existence of Bitcoin and what it allows us to do with Bitcoin. It can increase privacy. It can it increases the amount of things that we can do with Bitcoin. But in that search for increased usability or a better user experience with Bitcoin, there are risks and those risks come with any updates to the code. And OpCat, what Andrew is suggesting here is that OpCat is a simple way relative to the other proposals. It is a simple way to update our nodes to allow these covenants without disallowing future proposals of covenants. And that with all of these, uh, or with OpCat coming via a soft fork, that a soft fork itself is possible and likely in Bitcoin's future because of what we got with SegWit, what we got with Taproot, and through the passage of time, we can see that these were proposals that didn't break Bitcoin or didn't affect Bitcoin's fundamentals as a decentralized currency network with backwards compatibility. So, Andrew, would you say that that's a fair summarization? And what would you like to emphasize here 
going away for the audience, please. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, yeah, thank you for that. And the thing I guess that I'd like to emphasize, um, actually, so one is that I really like cat, but I think I've, I've gotten that across. But the other, like the, the key point I would say is that I feel like the Bitcoin community is getting ready to exercise its soft fork muscles again. And not we're not going to overuse it. Like like people, I see no indication that we'll, we'll slide into to something the ossificationists fear, right? Which is that we're just start like updating and doing like all sorts of wild things all willy nilly, um, and it's too fast, and we aren't thinking about the consequences, kind of thing. But neither are we going into this mode where Bitcoin is just like no more changes can never happen, because I we're not there yet. Like at some point we'll be there. Like Bitcoin can do everything that it needs to do. But I would submit that it needs to do something like covenants, and currently it's not there. So I would I would like to see us. I would like to see the Bitcoin network changing again. Um, and I think yeah, Cat is a is a good way to start. Excellent. Well, the company that Andrew met, uh, didn't name but mentioned is Bitmain. I'm not afraid to mention it. Uh, this is a good book, The Block Size War, to summarize what happened in Segwit and that and that battle. Uh, between what Andrew felt shouldn't there shouldn't have been the opposition that was there, and what we found out is that there was a source of that op opposition. It was economically motivated, not necessarily uh, software motivated. And uh, so, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today at the Bitcoin Layer. There are a thousand other things that I'd like to ask you, but we'll have to save it for the next uh, visit. And please tell people where to find your information. I know you're not on social media, but how can they find what you are working on? And we will provide links to uh, the website that you mentioned, as well as some of your posts that discuss uh, these issues about OpCat and, and Covenants. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so you can find me. I'm not as as you say. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on X. I'm not on. I'm not even on Facebook or, or Instagram or anything. Uh, but you can find me on GitHub as a Polstra. Uh, that's where you can see whatever I, I happen to be working on. I spend a lot of my time maintaining the Rust Bitcoin project there. And then if you want to talk to me, you're gonna have to get an IRC client. So you can find me on Libera on um, Bitcoin Wizards or or a number of Bitcoin channels. Uh, my nick there is Andy Toshi. That's really the only way to the only way to find me these days. Excellent. I'm Nick Batia with Andrew Polstra, head of research at Blockstream. Thank you for joining us here at the Bitcoin Layer. We'll catch you next time. Great. Thanks, Thanks. Andrew. The Bitcoin Layer is proud to be sponsored by River. Go check them out today at river.com slash TBL for a special offer of up to $100 worth of Bitcoin for free when you go sign up. Now, the reason that we love River is that they are a Bitcoin only exchange. There's no confusion when you go there on what you're buying. But really importantly about River is that they do not use a third party custodian. They have their own multi-signature solution that means that when you buy Bitcoin on River, that Bitcoin is not being stored by another party. River is storing it in their own multi-signature way, and they encourage you to get your Bitcoin into your own self-custody and help with educational resources on that front. Go check them out today, river.com slash TBL.